What influence does the United States have as Israel seeks to avenge the slaughter of 1,200 people on October 7th and to remove Hamas from power in Gaza? Our first guest tonight, Josh Paul, resigned from the State Department soon after October 7th in protest of what he said were unscrutinized U.S. arms transfers to Israel. In his resignation letter, he said the Israeli response and American support, quote, will only lead to more and deeper suffering for both the Israeli and Palestinian people, and is not in the long-term American interest. And Josh Paul is joining me now. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much indeed for having me. So, I was struck by what the U.S. Defense Secretary said. I mean, this is a very bold military assessment that this amount of civilian uh, killing is going to lead not only to this tragedy that the world is witnessing, but a strategic, he used the word defeat. Yes. And so tell me, how do, you, how do you assess what he said? I think he's right. And I think what you see is a tension between those of us who have worked uh, in political and military fields uh, on the ground in the Middle East uh, and in the defense establishment in the uniformed services uh, who understand that this is not going to work. This is not going to lead to the result that Israel wants. It is just going to prolong uh, the suffering of both the Israeli and the Palestinian people for another generation. Uh, as opposed to, I think, a very political, ideological perspective uh, that is coming from the political level in the U.S. and, and in Israel and in the U.K., uh, that thinks that there is a way to make this work. There is not, and the suffering we are seeing on the ground really reflects that. I can't recall a time uh, in my experience where I've seen such a disconnect between our values and our actions or between the perspectives of our political leadership and the realities on the ground. Can I ask you... Where, where and how you draw that line and make that difference. This is not the first time Israel has gone to war against Hamas in Gaza, and it's not the first time there has been backlash around the world. What makes you say that this is so different to have caused you to have resigned? So, a number of factors, the first of which is just the scope and the scale. You know, here we are two months into this conflict, and we have seen three times more children die, 6,000 in Gaza, than in two years of Russia's war against Ukraine. Uh, we have seen over 50 journalists killed, over 100 UN aid workers, over 200 uh, medical professionals. You know, do you know what it takes to be a doctor in Gaza? Um, so well, the scale... We've interviewed a lot of them, and it's a terrible situation for the them. The scale of the loss has been astounding. And, of course, my role in the State Department involved approving many of these major arms transfers that are going to Israel right now that are enabling uh, this killing. But th this is American policy. It's not like these are rogue transfers. This is American policy, bipartisan, decades long. Israel is America's strongest ally in the Middle East, and America provides the most aid in the world to Israel, and obviously to Egypt as well, uh, but in, the, in general to Israel. Again, what is so unscrutinized about this? What was so different that made you resign publicly? Well, in all the arms transfers I've been a part of discussing before, including to Israel, uh, there has always been space for discussion and debate. You can raise concerns about how are these arms going to be used? Uh, do we have confidence that laws of war, laws of proportionality are going to be respected? Uh, do we have concerns about some of the units that these arms might be going to and their track records? Uh, what was different here was that there was no discussion. There was no space for that discussion. Uh, there was simply an approach of essentially the barn doors are open, and that remains the case. Uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal reported just in the last couple of days that America has transferred over 4,000 dumb bombs to Israel, uh, several thousand guidance kits, and 45,000 uh, artillery shells. So the barn doors remain open, and while I'm certainly encouraged uh, to hear what uh, Vice President Harris said what Secretary Austin has said, uh, for as long as those barn doors remain open, I don't know why Israel would take those warnings seriously. Can I just read the State Department response to your resignation? Um, uh, basically, he's saying that it expects and appreciates employees have different beliefs. And, of course, one thing that is actually kind of interesting for all of us is to know that there is a dissent, there's an official dissent channel in the State Department that allows people uh, to air their, their concerns. And that was, you know, history uh, from the Vietnam War. This is what the State Department says about you. With respect to this specific criticism that's been aired, we have made very clear that we strongly support Israel's right to defend itself. We're going to continue providing the security assistance that they need to defend themselves. But the President and the Secretary 
of state, has spoken to this very clearly, that we expect Israel to abide by all international law as they defend themselves. Israel says it's doing that to the best of its ability. So I think we have a responsibility as the larger, more powerful partner in this relationship to give advice, to give guidance, to step in when things are not going right. And when we say that we have a responsibility to or a commitment to defend Israel and to support Israel's security, I have, think we have to look at the situation on the ground and say, is that what is actually happening? Is Israel more secure as a result of our assistance? Or has our military assistance enabled Israel to move ahead with the expansion of settlements in the West Bank, to continue the siege of Gaza, and to take steps that ultimately undermine its own security rather than leading to a comprehensive peace? As you know, the U.S. administration believes, uh, and, and uh, you know, whether it says it publicly or behind closed doors, that the only way to get... For instance, there, it's not a secret that there's no love loss between President Biden and, and Prime Minister Netanyahu before this, Correct. over the uh, attempted, essentially, these are my words, overthrow of a democratic system in their so-called judicial reform. I mean, President Biden didn't even invite him to the White House. It's a total rarity. However, they believe that in order to affect Israeli policy, the likes of which you're talking now, to, to, to affect the policy and make it more towards the peace process, they have to embrace Israel, defend Israel, support Israel, in order to get the trust of the Israeli people so that they can then speak, you know, speak clearly to the Israeli government. And you saw what happened under the Obama administration. Um, the people of Israel didn't support the Obama administration. They thought... Obama didn't support them. So, first of all, I would ask where that embrace gets the United States. Uh, if you look at what is unfolding now, it is not only a disaster in Gaza, but it is a foreign policy disaster for the United States across the Arab world and, frankly, across the global south. Uh, we seem like hypocrites when we criticize Israel, uh, where rather when we criticize Russia uh, for human rights abuses, but fail to do so with Israel. Um, and so I think that our, our embrace, we have to be careful with that embrace, because it is, draws us in as well. Uh, secondly, of course, the answer is we do have leverage that we can use within that embrace. I'm not suggesting that America should not remain close with Israel. I'm suggesting simply that as we are the provider of arms, as we are the provider of billions of dollars in taxpayer-funded assistance every year uh, to what is actually a wealthy country, uh, we do have a fair amount of leverage. And, of course, we provide Israel with security and diplomatic backup uh, across the region that has enabled its integration. Uh, we have a lot of leverage here to set Israel on a better path and to end this senseless killing in Gaza. We are not using it. How does... What happened on October 7th in Israel was barbaric. Mm -hmm. It was savage. Yes. We've heard the stories of rape and gang rape, of children being shot to death in front of their parents. We know what's happened with more than 250 people who've been taken hostage, including babies. How does a nation get... I don't even know what the right word is. Beyond it, I don't know what, what the right word is. How does it get to feel that it's being supported and that it then doesn't, you know, have to do what's going on in Gaza right now? The elders, which is a, a group of former presidents, prime ministers and, and UN officials, have also questioned now, they've just put out a, a, a statement questioning arms transfers and talking about the inhumanity that's happening in Gaza that's rising to an intolerable level. I think what happened on October 7th was an absolute atrocity, was a thousand atrocities. Uh, I think at the same time we condemn those atrocities, we have to condemn the atrocities that happen every day to Palestinians in the West Bank. You mentioned sexual violence. Uh, I was part of the human rights vetting process for arms going to Israel and a charity called Defense of Children International Palestine uh, drew our attention at the State Department to the sexual assault, actually the rape, of a 13-year-old boy that occurred in an Israeli prison in the Moskobia in Jerusalem. Uh, we examined these allegations. Uh, we believed they were credible. We put them to, Israel, to uh, the government of Israel. And you know what happened the next day? The IDF went into the DCIP offices and removed all their computers and declared them a terrorist entity. Um, I think it is vital that atrocities not happen to anyone, not sexual, not sexual violations, not any kind of gross violation of human rights. We are looking at a situation where there is so much dehumanification, where people are not seen for the value that they have. And I think that's true whether you're talking about those who are attacked on their kibbutz or those who are attacked in their homes in Gaza or in the West Bank. What we really need is to centre 
the human beings who are at the core uh, and who are suffering so much uh, in, in this conflict. Do you believe that in order to have some kind of peaceful resolution so this never happens again, that Hamas has to be removed from power? How do you neutralize Hamas? The answer is through a lasting political settlement that provides a Palestinian state, uh, not a process that promises one, holds out the promise, and never gets to it. Uh, you neutralize Hamas by showing the Palestinian people that if they want to succeed, if they want to succeed, the route is there for them to do so through a political process rather than through violent resistance. Uh, until we have that political process in place, you cannot defeat the Palestinian resistance.